I interviewed a number of managers and what I found was that the key determinant of effectiveness had no, very little, I should say very little to do with training, very little to do with strategies, very little to do with technique or experience. Hmm. What it had to do with most importantly was the level of what, what is called most, many people have not heard of this, but the level of what is called psychological safety amongst their teams. So, and wow. psychological safety is, it's defined, the researchers define it as a sense that we are in an environment that is supportive and safe in the face of us making mistakes, where it is safe to make mistakes right. and think through problems where there is not a clear answer. <music> Was that the key? If you were going to look at staff uh, uh, maltreatment of clients, the thing that I found is that the key relationship you want to look at is not the relationship between the client and the staff. The key relationship you wanted to look at was the relationship between the staff and their managers. Interesting. Because what the I office found, dynamics, the inner dynamics of it, the inner dynamics, because what wow. I found is that most people that were abusive or neglected to residents, they weren't evil, bad people. They were just so disconnected from the organization as they were alienated from the organization and its mission and, or, and alienated from the people that were trying to supervise them. Wow. So this was all in the process of trying to get a master's degree. And at the end of that process, I gained a lot of knowledge, but I knew that I was only just kind of scratching the very tip of the iceberg. And that's when I decided to move ahead. I, I, I felt like there was a larger problem to solve here that wasn't really being addressed. And so I decided at that point to move ahead and pursue a PhD and kind of start to wrestle with bigger questions. And here's, here's what I found. This is what, what interested me. What I saw, which was um, part of my experience at the social service agency, which is also part of most work experiences today, is that the management models and the management assumptions underneath the, of them, the, the underlying kind of worldview underneath these models was based on thinking that was more than 400 years old. Which, oh my which, when, when you think about this, when you think about this, and I, and I don't want to get- Dinosaur thinking. Di I call it, do you know what I call it, David, with my students? I said, there's the dinosaurs are running the asylum. The dinosaurs. Oh my word. <laughs> When you think about it, I, love I, it. Don't, I don't want to get um, not judgmental about it, yeah. but, but when I say it's 400 years old, I am not kidding you. It is based, it literally on, is. <laughs> it's based on a, a paradigm of thought, a way of understanding the world that is actually still common today um, called mechanistic thinking. And it, and, it, and it tracks back to our friend, Mr. Isaac Newton, you know, with the apple on the head. <laughs> and what what Newton did, which was unique at that point, it was groundbreaking at the time, because up until that time, how we understood the world and how we understood each other was based on superstition, myth, magic, yeah. very rooted in the church. And what, what Newton came forward and said was that, no, the, or, the universe operates like a giant clock. Everything works by precision patterns and there's a clear, logical formula for everything. Mm. That, that kind of thinking is, they, they sometimes term it mechanistic thinking, and um, sometimes it's called rationalism. But what I found is that that kind of thinking at the time was groundbreaking. And right. it allowed us to do things like the Industrial Revolution. I mean, we wouldn't be here today if it weren't for that kind of thinking. But here's what happened. Underlying all that type of thought is the premise that the world is orderly and predictable and there is always a clear logical answer now think about it a second i'm working in this social service agency where even under the best of conditions there's always sort of this undercurrent of disruption and chaos mm -hmm. The problem is, though, and this is where I saw the split between management and the workers, was that 
workers were dealing with this upheaval and management all the time, whereas the managers, the workers were dealing with that, whereas the managers were under the presumption that things should be logical and orderly because they're working from this very kind of old mechanistic mindset that right. doesn't account for disruption and complexity. So here's what started. Wow. To well right. said, my friend. Yeah. Isn't it, isn't I'm it, riveted by this because this is really, is this not, and just again, I, I want you to do all the talking. Isn't this just the acorn of sort of human psychology? Isn't this sort of the, uh, the epicenter of how we construct meaning and how, how, history unfolds right it's so interesting yeah it keep is going really i love it because here's what happened and this is where this is what really started to shift my focus and again my story just like i study non-logical disruptive dynamics um i could say that my life is also at times very non-logical and disruptive because, oh i'm into that yeah i planned to go and get this phd and then either um, you know, teach nonprofit management or run a big nonprofit or something. But interestingly, around this same time, um, actually it was the first semester in my PhD program, someone introduced me to this wild thing called Facebook. <laughs> <And> Hello. <laughs> that started my, um, my social media journey. And, and of course, you know, and this was around, what year was this, 2008, 2009? Yeah, yeah, that's kind of the same for me. Around 2007, I started on Facebook. Okay, and, you know, and, and the platform that I really kind of kind of grabbed a hold of right away was uh, Twitter. And yeah. so at the same time, I'm studying all these dynamics and, at you know, for management and this old thinking, and also at the same time, starting to look at the increasing digitalization and networking of human society. And one of the things that I realized when I started to look at this sort of adversarial dynamic between workers and management, I found that this just this dynamic, and, and you alluded to it, Peter, this dynamic wasn't just limited to social service agencies. What I found is that most work environments were dealing with an under current of chaos and disruption that fell many times to the frontline people and in turn was sort of um, dismissed or criticized by top management. So what wow. I found was this sort of split in thinking. There were like, it was like management and workers were living in two separate worlds. So I really started to dig into this and what I found was that this really wasn't even about it wasn't about social service and it wasn't even so much about social media or digital technology it was when i started to dig deeper in this i realized and this is where i really got started to get excited i started to see that there was a tectonic shift happening in human society in in our culture in the yeah. trajectory of homo sapiens and i'm not kidding you when i talk about I talked about um, 400 year old thinking mm -hmm. and how we're still rooted in it. And when that, now think about it, if we can just go back a second, um, 400 years ago when Newton and people like Descartes were putting forth these theories of rationalism, the world was steeped in mysticism and religion mm -hmm. to the point where everything had a mystical component or mystical reason. When they introduced rationalism, it it had like an earthquake effect on human society. Hmm. We are, what I started to realize, and, and there are a lot of other people now I see who are thinking this too, is that human society is in a similar place again, where we are in, we're, we're living according to a mythology of sorts. And that's the mythology of mechanistic and logical processes. But the problem is that our lives don't conform to that. So what I started to see is, okay, what's, what's, where are we headed? What is this about? And here's where the major light bulbs went off for me. In most me mechanistic thinking, and especially what you see in organizations, the organizing factor, the thing that people kind of fall back on is this notion of a logical process, a logical answer. Mm -hmm. Well, we know that our lives don't always conform to that. So what's the anchor? The anchor, believe it or not, Peter, it's relationship. 
Yes. What I found, and, and isn't this interesting? What I found is that we're entering this era where relationship is becoming the grounding force in our lives. And what did you know it? Around this same time, human society starts to invent these platforms and these tools yeah. for solidifying and connecting relationship across diverse boundaries and cultures. Right. And I thought, holy, I, really, I got very- It's amazing. I thought, holy smokes, there are big changes underway. And it's almost like there's this new unfolding of human evolution going on. And of course, it, it, when you look at it, it's playing out for a lot of us in our work lives and in our work situations. So that's what I based my- That's beautiful, on. David. I mean, I, Robert says, Robert, great. First of all, doctor, amazing, amazing uh, uh, um, analysis. I, I couldn't agree more. Robert says, amazing how Facebook and other platforms changed millions of people's lives personally and professionally. Absolutely, Robert. Michael says, you talk about the positive and negative, but the bottom line is how you look at it in your life and how long you dwell on the negative. My philosophy, today is the oldest you'll ever, you've ever been, yet the youngest you'll ever be. So enjoy this day while it lasts. Very beautiful, Michael. And I don't think that David is saying not to uh, embrace this, but to have a little bit of understanding because, it, it, and let me, let me kind of ask you, David, uh, sure. doctor, doctor, <laughs> Doctor, <laughs> may I call you David? <laughs> Please call me David. Okay, I, dude, I it's so much fun. You. It's so much fun. Listen, I tell people I You worked so hard to get that. You worked so hard. And I was like, I was watching your journey. He documented his journey in his nation on Snapchat, on Facebook. I was joking with him earlier. Enough already. Get your damn brutal. PhD. <laughs> it, was it was awesome. I, Dr. David. Yes, Robert says, but if I may, if I may, David, um, this sort of disparate, uh, uh, you know, disconnection between management, right, and the frontline yes. kind of sort of blue collar or frontline workers or the busy bees, if you yes. will. Isn't this predicated upon the lack of, to me, I mean, my whole kind of thing is something I say all the time. I think the, the greatest disease facing mankind is misunderstanding, which is why I love this type of exchange which is why I always advocate that it always feels good to talk about things. It yes. always feels good to communicate. Yes. Could the epicenter of this issue be related? This disparate, you know, disconnect that you see between upper management, between, you know, uh, uh, lower tier workers, could that be a very severe lack of communication? And these are not stupid people, David. Like right. they're not dumb, like the CEO of Ford, the CEO, like JP Morgan, these individuals, they're not stupid people. So, so A, could it be communication? And B, what are some ways in which you come in and what your kind of thoughts and what your components to look at to fix this and remedy this, what are some ways to fix that? What, what would you say to that? Well, first of all, I think you're exactly right. I think it is predicated on misunderstanding and miscommunication. And when I started to dig into this, when I really started to look at the deeper kind of dynamics in play, I found something that's very interesting. It is miscommunication, but it's not even that people aren't understanding one another. They're talking entirely different languages. Wow. And it's almost exactly. like I'm talking German, you're yeah. talking French, and we don't understand one another. Well but said. We assume that we do. Let me give you an end. Let me use um, an analogy that might help explain this all. Please do. And Gord, I'm going to get to your question. Gord has an amazing question. Tina says, it comes down to the lack of communication or inability to communicate on the same level. Two different languages. Exactly. Tina agrees with you, David, and I do that too. That is exactly right. Now, think about this for a second. Again, we're dealing with this old model of the world of the universe. And think about, um, I, I want to, to use an analogy of a beach ball. And imagine that the world was a big beach ball, all a solid color. And that color, say it was a big blue beach ball. And in that blue beach ball, we all lived according to blue rules and spoke a blue language and had blue values and everything was the same across the world. But and that is the mechanistic model. Everything's right. the same. There are universal laws that are true no matter what. 
Now, what we live in today is a complex world. Now, imagine that same beach ball, but I'm sure we've all seen them. The beach balls with the multicolors, the multi-stripe beach ball. Right. Imagine, but imagine that ball was so big that I'm on the red patch, but all I can see is red around me. But over on the other side, there's someone on a blue patch and there's someone on a green patch. And each patch has its own language. It has its own um, set of values. It has its own logic. See, that's what complexity really means is that there are different and diverse experiences and thought forms arising at the same time that have to be blended. And, and what we're doing today is we're operating under the premise that we're all on one big solid beach ball, same color. So I don't understand why you would say, you know, the world is, is red, Peter. The world right. is the world is definitely right. blue. And if anybody thinks the world is red, well, they must be short sighted or delusional. It and sounds like what you're saying, David, if I may, sure. it sounds like what you're saying, if I'm understanding you correctly, is that people don't, they lack this, this, this ability to see, could it be that they're, they're lacking this ability to see their perspective, their, their fellow coworkers, their fellow, you know, uh, their, their wives, their family, their friends, right. uh, their upper management, their executives, their supervisors, that they're failing because of this language sort of barrier uh, or because that they, they, all, they have all these different patches, as you say, on the beach ball, that they only see, they're so myopic, that they only see their, their POV and that's it. And that the it. way to rectify that is to sort of kind of, you know, uh, posit this idea of empathy and emotional intelligence. Is that what I'm understanding or no? That's a piece of it. But I think the core underneath it is understanding the notion of a world view. Ooh, and love it. Because once you understand that all of us see the world and respond to it from the perspective of our own worldview, then it becomes, um, I think, easier to negotiate the differences. And here's what I mean. A worldview is, is for, uh, for those who may not be familiar with the concept, a worldview is a large framework or a set of beliefs or a set of assumptions from which we, you, me, the mailman, the man in the moon, interpret our lived reality. Right. Okay? Like, for instance, look, for instance, and I hope I don't get anybody uh, arguing here. But like, <laughs> That's okay. We need some controversy. All our shows have been total uh, butterballs, so we need some controversy. Oh, well, well, Inject okay. some controversy. We need it. <laughs> <laughs> like, look at the last election cycle. What you had was you had two groups deeply committed to very different worldviews. And so that is why you had very different approaches, very different candidates. Right. And so what happens is that um, our worldview is what we want to do. It's, it's human nature to to presume that everybody should have the same worldview. But the reality is now in our complex world is that there are multiple different types of worldviews. And so what happens is we tend to, like the old thinking tends to say, well, there are good and bad worldviews or stupid and smart worldviews. Right. But the reality is, is that we live in a diverse world with mm. people having all kinds of experiences. And I think this gets back to the organizational question. I think what is incumbent upon our leaders today is to recognize that we have a responsibility to integrate and, and collaborate with multiple worldviews. And that's where the relation, you had mentioned, um, relational connection, trust, empathy, emotional yeah. intelligence. Mm. What we can do is once- we Which is that, not being advocated in universities. I mean, let alone, I can't imagine, I would imagine actually secondary school and elementary school probably doing a better job of this. You see the introduction of certain kind of reflective techniques such as mindfulness and things of that nature. But, but you know, in higher education, we're advocating IQ, right? We're advocating, you know, math comp competency, statistic competency, analytical comp competency on a data level. But how do we make sense out of that data? How do we interpret that data? How do we, you know, uh, uh, immerse that data into our everyday lives? 
it's so it's so interesting. Is David really quickly? Let me just get to. I, I, I have so much to ask you. I'm so excited. I'm stuttering. Gord says you're doing fantastic, David. Thank you so much. Thank Gord you. says I've seen leaders around me in the in the corporate world, and actually I know Gord well. He's a fellow uh, a creator, a YouTuber, and and video content creator. Uh, he used to work in the in the corporate world. He was a guest on this show, actually, uh, David. Um, move ahead. I've seen leaders around me in the corporate world, past life, move ahead the more they were able to have less feeling for the staff and have the ability to execute the orders from above. Wow. Those yeah. that do this don't walk the four corners as if they suffer in the inhuman mechanistic role they execute. I'm going to pin that one, Gord. That's a, I, let me see if I can pin that because that is a phenomenal comment. I love that. It doesn't look like I can, but I'm going to try to. I have heard that the higher up you are in the corporate food chain, the more you become defined by the values of this inanimate entity. And it seems to me that once they retire, it is more difficult for you to relate to others and have successful relationships post-retirement. Hence, this is why I think what David's talking about is so phenomenally significant. In other words, it's less humane the higher up the corporate leadership food chain. Do you have a perspective on this? Wow, David, I can't wow. think of a better, I can't, I mean, Gord, you took the words right out of my mouth. I mean, but you said it, you articulated it much more eloquently. That is very, wonderful. very interesting, David. What are your thoughts on that? The higher up the food chain, the less humane, and the more you execute mechanistically, it seems the more you're rewarded. I think that's true because what we have, and this is not, I mean, and again, I'm gonna go back to the last election cycle. What we have is we have a death of a paradigm. That's what's going on right now. The old way is dying. And when the old way is dying, two things happen simultaneously. A new alternative begins to emerge and the old alternative doubles down out of survival, out of yeah. So that's, so why do we see, and I read an article in Fortune Magazine that really opened my eyes to this because it said, it was talking about the outrageously high salaries that CEOs are being paid. Right. And it said, and they said the rationale behind these high salaries is that corporate boards are terrified and they want somebody, they want someone or something that's going to save them from the disruption and dismantling of their way of life and their way of doing business. And so what we find is, I mean, look at the president of the United States, whether you love him or hate him, he is a CEO. That's yes, that. yes, and, executive uh, in chief, right. Executive in chief. He is, you know, very much a, a mechanistic, rational mindset for sure. Absolutely. And, and whether you voted for him or not, we have to agree that a lot of people did vote for him. Which may be actually a characteristic of the position. You know, I mean, there's been a few anomalies, right? right. But I love what you said there, David. It's, it's a mechanistic, the, 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 chief, the, the chief executive officer of our nation, right? The chief executive officer exactly right. is, is operating under a very kind of, you know, antiquated way of thinking, right? Or, or maybe, let's just say, a, a way of thinking that has you know, been comfortable or at least is resistant to change and very highly, like you said, survivor mode. And, and, and it's almost like if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But depending on this worldview or depending on what view you have, can you really ac accurately assess whether it's broken or not, right? I want to get to Tina's uh, uh, comment here, if I may, David, because Sure. This is fantastic conversation. This is a great conversation. I'm so like, I'm like elated. This is like, I'm, I'm so excited. Tina said, uh, I had this conversation with my son-in-law. He said that his employer said to him that $10 an hour is too much to pay an hourly worker. I told him that his employer inherited this business, grew up well off, and now is a multimillionaire. His employer has no idea what it is like to live paycheck to paycheck. And when he was a young person, 50 plus years ago, $10 an hour would have been a lot of money. So he thinks that his workers making eight fifty dollars should be doing well. There will never be a meeting of minds here. What do you think about that? I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of talk about wage and there's a lot. Is this just another confirmation, David, of that sort of gap 
between That's executives right. and and the majority and and what are some ways in which because we have, we've been talking a lot about the problem i wonder david and i know that you've studied years of this and you in your dissertation probably had a lot to do with it the, the title i was actually trying to research your dissertation title the title escapes me what was the title of your dissertation it i'm sorry was, what i did was i looked at how middle managers made sense of environments that were continually disruptive, their ability to come together and to be effective, to be effective in the face of ongoing disruption. Right. I mean, and this is what you do, right, David? This is what you're, yes. this is how you service your clients. This is how you yes. service your, your audience, correct? So, exactly so right. how do we, how do we bridge this? How do we bridge this gap? Well, again, we're, we're really having, the thing that I want to point out is that we're in a sense, and this is great because we're really having two conversations here. We're having, and they're both important. Right. One is about how do we solve this problem or how is this problem being solved? Another is how do we deal with the, the artifacts or the relics of a worldview that is in decay. So when when you're uh, was it Tina? Who yeah, Tina, 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 Tina Shang. Yeah, hi Tina. Hello, great, Tina. great comment. And Gord has another interesting comment as well. We'll get to you, Gord. I promise. But it's so. Uh, let me just shift gears for a second, if I may, and talk yes. about my research and what I found. This is what I wanted to ask you about specifically. Very true. Yes, go okay. ahead, please. Um, this was very surprising to me because. What I was looking at was I was looking at how people, how managers made sense of environments that were continually disorienting or chaotic, continually in an upheaval of one point in, in one way or another. And here's what I found out that was very interesting. I thought when I went to interview, and I, and I interviewed a number of managers, and what I found was that the key determinant of effectiveness had no, very little, I should say, very little to do with training, very little to do with strategies, very little to do with technique or experience. <laughs> what it had to do with most importantly was the level of what, what is called most, many people have not heard of this, but the level of what is called psychological safety amongst their teams. So, and wow. psychological safety is, it's defined, the researchers define it as a sense that we are in an environment that is supportive and safe in the face of us making mistakes, where it is safe to make mistakes right. and think through problems where there is not a clear answer. Here's why that's important, because most- I love it. I love it. Most workers today work in an environment where there are no clear black and white answers. Most managers, or, or I should say most executives, yeah, I was gonna, are yeah. black and white answers. Right. Managers are, are a little different. I should, I should differentiate there. But anyway, so what happens is, what I found is that these teams were most effective when it was safe to admit mistakes, admit not knowing, admit being baffled and confused. Because what, what, here's what happens, Peter. Imagine you and I are trying to solve a problem together and neither of us know what that problem really is. Mm. But we're trying to present it to each other like we do. Like we <laughs> yeah, well, first of all, so, it, so, it sounds like one of my, my, my department meetings. <laughs> But think, right. So, think, <laughs> and, and I'm not gonna. And, and let's say, let's say that we have a we have a supervisor who every time we say I don't know criticizes us. Right. So that would be an environment of very low psychological safety. But let's flip it for a second. Let's assume for a second. People are afraid to say I don't know as well. I don't know. They're afraid to say that. And I can tell you, professors are afraid to say that. Dinosaurs are afraid to say that. Executives are. I I tell my students this, David. I say, I wish the president. What are you going to do about ISIS? Okay, you know what? I have no idea, but guess what? I mean, that's not good enough, right? But you say, you know what? I don't know, but I'm going to do my best to figure it out. I've got a lot of smart people around me. I've got a lot of researchers. I've got a great team. 
we're going to do our best. But what do they do? They give this politically correct diatribe that's so mechanistic, it's a beautiful adjective, so mechanistic that it almost just narcotizes the audience to sleep and nothing is really resolved. Well, think I mean, about I, it. I love what you're saying, David. I love your research, what you've come up with. Well, what I found was, imagine, let me go back for a second, Peter, to the moment we were talking about. You and I are dealing with a problem. We don't know what. Yes, we, yes, 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 only, please. Here, here's, and here's what workers are finding more and more. Not only do we not know what the solution is, we can't even clearly define the problem. Right. That's what I find right. that most organizations are dealing with. Now, think about it for a second. If you and I felt psychologically safe, we could say to each other, well, Peter, well, David, I don't know. What do you think it is? Well, it could be this. It could be that. What do you think? Well, no, because da, 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 da. Hey, maybe it's da, da, da. I don't know. Let's try that. Let's experiment with that. And what I'm, what I'm basically giving you is the model of problem solving that I found in my effective teams. They did, they, there wasn't a, a, it wasn't possible to have a big grand solution. What they would do is that they would inch their way through it, conversation by conversation. Right, probe, investigate, dig, right? Right, right. right. So right. The key, remember what I said a few minutes ago, that the anchoring uh, foundation- Safety. Or is, is safety and relationship. So right. Oh, yes. Out. Way before. Yes. Relationships. Yes. Right. I said way back. Right. So, right. So I'm, I'm, I'm remembering that. Yes. If you and I, Peter, if you and I are a team, so then the determining factor in our ability to solve complex, highly ambiguous problems is going to be the quality of our relationship and the level of trust between us, because that's going to open us up to be an in what I call explorer mind, exploratory mind. Beautiful. And that's what we need. Oh my God, David, I, I, I have one thing I want to add to that, but I want to get to some of the comments. Gord says, I worked for a large HR global public company. When I joined, we had a huge Christmas party at Posh Hotel to celebrate. When I was let go eight years later, there were no parties. And I was told by leadership that I was not allowed to buy pizza for them because I was told that I may show up another manager that couldn't afford to do it. Wow. Tina says, in the case of my son-in-law, corporate managers, corporate, in the case of my son-in-law, corporate make managers jobs very difficult because they refuse to provide the pay, training, and benefits that would be necessary to maintain a stable workforce. So turnover, absolutely. Absenteeism, turnover, these are huge issues. My students in my oral communications class right now, David, we're working on a project dealing with the issue of absenteeism and researching why absenteeism seems to be on the rise okay. in the 21st century. And, and I would love for you to comment on that too. And, but I want to get, because this is amazing. I had the best performance, Gord says, I had the best performance of all my peer managers. But, and when I was let go after just winning a Global Excellence Award, my boss told my team that they were not allowed to speak to me. Wow. Yeah. I didn't yeah. even know this about you, Gord. This is amazing. You know, I, I, I was going to, uh, I was going to uh, add something to what you just said there. Um, sure. This, uh, this idea, Oh, the, the study of Kostakis and Fowler. Do you know about that study by any I chance? Don't, no, no, no. I don't. So there's a study by Kostakis and Fowler. I think it was a really, they did a really large uh, uh, test time period, like a 30 year study on is obesity uh, is it is a lot of the you know a lot of the discussion a lot of the debate has been that is obesity something that is you know genetic is it a genetic disposition and Kostakis and Fowler and you can Google this they researched that obesity is actually like the flu you can actually it's infectious you can catch it from other people so what they did they did this study on what you're talking about with relationships they mm -hmm. did this study that if you were if you knew somebody in your inner circle who was obese, this is the result of their 30 year study, 65, there is a 65% chance that you yourself would be obese. Now, if you had a friend who wasn't obese, but they had a friend who was obese, there was like a 35 to 45% chance that you would be obese. So, I mean, I can go on and on, but just to sum up, the hypothesis or the ultimate sort of result of this test was is that your social relationships, like you said, 
your network, your inner network, the people you surround yourself with, can you end up emulating, you end up, end up defining who you are. They end up defining how you think. They end up defining how you look at the world, right? That's I mean, exactly it's, right. it's an amazing study, and it's, I think it's something that you should definitely check out, David. I uh, will. It's so, you could actually Google it. It takes two seconds after the interview. Sure. After we're done here, I'd love your thoughts on that. Maybe you could leave it in the comments. Sure. And because it sounds to me your studies reflected something really interestingly similar about relationships being this sort of, uh, you know, really this North Star, something that we need to look at very carefully. How are we managing our relationships? How are we nurturing them? What are we doing to sustain them? What are we doing to enliven them, right? And make them grow and, 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 and hopefully last, right? I mean, it's so, right. it's, and how do, they, how do they affect us? How do right. our relationships affect us? Are you surrounded by toxicity? Are you even aware that you're surrounded by toxicity? Um, are you communicating? So, I mean, this is just fantastic stuff, David. I love it. If, if I may, if I may, I would love to just kind of talk a little bit about, because now here we are in the 21st century. Yes. Now here we are in 2017. And, and I can't even believe it's like almost May, practically. It's like I April. Know. We're in the middle of, middle of April. It feels, like, it feels like April's over. I know it's only April 9th, but it feels like April's already over. I mean, it's been, it's, 2017 has just been a blur. I know you've been super busy. Yes. Talk to me a little bit about how you bring what you do to social media because I love your presence, man. I got to say kudos to you. My hat's off to Thank you. you. I first met David, uh, uh, Nez Nation. I fir first was introduced to David through Twitter oh. and uh, I loved the stuff that he was posting. I love the interesting articles and just thought pieces and ideas and just something that I feel that this medium has such a power that you can share something of value. It doesn't have to have this dystopian cloud that it's going to ruin everybody and ruin society and ruin our teenagers. I wanted to ask you, David, and then I saw your Snapchat, which I love your Snapchat. Thank and I you. think you're actually, your Snapchat audience, if, correct me if I'm wrong, is growing pretty steadily. Am I incorrect in that? It is, but I do have to, I, 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 Please. I think the cardinal sin is that I did neglect my audience for a while. I wasn't near the final days or the final, I should say, the last month or two of my dissertation. The demands were so intense, I couldn't post, and I sort of... Oh, I'm sure they understood. I've had those bouts, too, where I just completely neglected my Snapchat audience, and it breaks my heart, right? Yes. I, I know what you're talking about. So talk to me, David. What do you think about applying your sort of uh, thesis and applying sort of your ideology and applying your sort of perspective to social media. Why social media? Because I love when people close to my age or around my age enter the foray and they're, and they're very active on these platforms because I do truly feel that Snapchat and these kind of platforms like that are 21st century storytelling tools. They they're are just 21st, they're 21st century storytelling tools. I would love to hear your thoughts on this and why you feel social media uh, is something that you need to be active on. I would love to hear your thoughts. Well, well, because I can tell you every, <laughs> in, in one sense, you know, part of a dissertation process involves creating original thought, but that's, sort yes. of, uh, that's sort of an odd term because <laughs> on, on the other, the other hand, None of it is, is original. None of it is contained within me. Maybe I brought a unique perspective to it, but I have to tell you, all knowledge that is meaningful today is collaborative knowledge. And Beautiful. That, again, remember what I was saying, like you and I like relationships. solve problems yeah. together. It's relationships. And one of the things that I get so passionate about with social media is that it is an opportunity to be they, they talk about the bubble effect or, or whatever, but, you know, like you can be in people, you know, just in an environment with your own values and so forth. But I think for the person that wants to reach out, that wants to learn things, yeah. that wants to grow, that wants to diversify, that's there as well. It's not like those communities are barred from anybody. It's there. And, and I'm saying this only because I came of, of age, if you will, with social media right when I was in the thick of my PhD process. And one of, one of the things that I found, and this is where I got passionate about social media, 
is that ideas and perspectives and mindsets were coming to me through my connection on social media that I wasn't getting in school and I wasn't getting in my face to face. Yeah. So yeah. it really enlarged my world. And that's one of the reasons. And, and here's the thing. One of the things I always keep in mind, and I would, I would encourage everybody to keep this in mind, because we look at all the changes going on with technology and, and in, in how we're connected socially and networking and so forth. This is not even the beginning. I mean, we're just on the brink. Of right. I feel the same way. Things. Yeah. I love the way you said that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Keep, so, yeah. It's, it's really, I mean, it's, it's hard to predict what's coming, except that you, we know that it's going to be a lot different than what we experience now. Just think about the integration of augmented reality and wow. artificial intelligence. And, and see, and again, I am a, um, I'm, maybe I'm a bit idealist about these things, but I see these tools and these platforms as not being the thing that's going to annihilate people and annihilate social connection. I see it such that it's going to catapult us into a new way of relating, a new way of connecting. And when I, when I talk to business leaders and when I talk to organizations, one of the things that I like to point out to them is that this is the new paradigm that is emerging. This is, and, and we can look at it. We can see how um, Google and, and Facebook and these other companies are really creating kind of a new model, a new framework for doing business and a new framework of success right. based on the power of connection and relatability. I think, you know, I wouldn't, I mean, what you're saying, I think, David, is, is it really kind of, to me, it resonates in the sense that, you know, it, it, the technology, technology is going to be advancing, whether, whether I think we like it or not. There's, I, don't, I don't see technology going, well, nah, forget that. Let's go back to horses, right? I just don't right. see that ever happening. No. So I think it also, I, I think the sort of idea is, or what I, where I kind of come from is, it just depends on who you connect with, how you use the technology, how you apply the technology, which I think that's why there's, such a, a place and a space for people like you, David, and others. And I'm hopefully trying to include myself in that category because I have a lot of, I can have, I have potential influence over a lot of my students, you know, each semester advocating the sort of positives of this, you know, form and this, uh, this medium and this tool, because I mean, Nez Nation, think about it. I've never met David personally. I've never met David right. face to face. But I knew, I just, I knew, David, when I saw your first tweet that I was like, oh, that's interesting. And then the three, three or four more tweets, then I saw his snaps and I was like, well, I really, I, I actually think, and I don't know if you remember this, David, I actually think I sent you a video. I sent you a video on Twitter, just a hello message, because I didn't want to send this sort of generic. I thought to myself, this guy's really interesting. And I really think that the stuff that he's doing is really cool. Maybe I can send him something that just kind of show how much I'm really engaged with his content. And I remember sending you a video saying, hey, David, this is Professor Nez. And I just wanted to say, hey, love the stuff that you're doing. And I think you responded with a video. You were in your car, stopped, not driving. No, right, right, right. <laughs> but I remember you responded and said, hey, Peter, I've noticed. And, and it, it kind of made me feel like, oh, cool. He's like, hey, I've noticed you too. And I've noticed your snaps. And I just want to say I, I can return the compliment. Nez Nation, I've never met David personally. I've never met Gord personally, which we're going to change that. Gord's got a great comment coming up. So does Tina. Thank you, Tina. I, but I'm, I feel like these people are, yeah, they're a part of my life. Yes. I feel like if you consume, which I, I do and others do and everybody does, yeah, I feel like that they're they are in the within the fabric of my existence, and that there is maybe not the, the the type of relationship that our grandfathers remembered, or maybe the relationships that even we remember as kids, but they're relationships nonetheless. Better, worse, I don't know, but I think that there's a lot to be said for the application of the technology and trying to find practical, intelligent methodologies to apply these technological tools. I love what you're saying, David. I think it's just phenomenal. Um, let me just really quickly, Gord says, the technology now enables far more intimate connection. 
I would agree. This is powerful, even if the people are in another part of the world. Oh, it transcends geographical location. Even, yeah, I mean, it totally transcends that. Uh, Gord says, I struggle with the idea. I think this is something I wanted to ask you about too, David. I struggle with the idea of being vulnerable and sharing myself in the internet social media ether. It's the unknown. You see how intelligent our audience is, David? Yes. <laughs> isn't this, this, this is an intelligent, I mean, oh, dashing yeah, I bunch. I, 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 <laughs> this I, isn't I, your I, average I, talk I, show, David. This, up. this is great. <laughs> um, it's the unknown aspect, Gord says, of how you will be received by those you don't know. Could this be a hangover from the corporate cage? Beautifully, so eloquently said, my friend. What, do you th- what are your thoughts on that? Do you think that... Do you, because you, you seem to be very courageous, I think. And I think you're very brave. <laughs> I mean, really, I think, I think I, I, I love it. I love the fact that you don't, you don't come off as inauthentic. You're very, you share what you share. And I even love how sometimes you're like, oh, you know, I messed that up. Let me, I'll get it on the next snap. You know, it's coming up. I, I, you roll with the punches really nicely. Thank you. This is an interesting comment by Gord. What, what are your thoughts on the trepidation that people feel? I think and, it's and, natural. Yeah. I'm sorry. No, go ahead, please, because that's that's the sort of the gist of my my question. And 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 what do you what do you say to those people, perhaps, if you if you have something? If not, it doesn't matter. Well, I, I don't I don't have you know some hard, but I, I do I do need to comment on that because uh, our one thing you just said about how kind of natural and kind of you know you, you see all the warts with me on social media, it's, right? It's simply a lack of impulse control. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, I, I definitely can share that feeling. I can share the sentiment for sure. Yeah. Somewhere along the line. I love it. I just yeah, love it. I have fun it's, with it, you know? You know, too, too many McDonald's French fries. Or something, <laughs> but but the, the, filters, the filters are gone. Yeah. Um, yeah. But one of the things that I found seriously is that another reason why I get so passionate about what's going on right now is I, I think that the challenges, like Gord alludes to this, um, because I, I've gone through that and I still go through it sometimes. I mean, it, it's natural. And one of the things that I'm thinking is that the immediacy and the instant, didn't Gord also say that's a very intimate format that we're working Right, here? right. Yes, and he did. I think, I he said the technology now enables far more intimate connection. That is exactly right. And intimacy breeds self-reflection. And self-reflection is sometimes it puts us in touch with what is greatest and most expansive within us. And mm-hmm. sometimes it puts us in touch with what is limiting or a barrier within us. And those, the fear of vulnerability and the fear of exposing yourself is natural. And, and Peter, I think you'll relate to this. I mean, I'm, I myself am coming off of a bit of a hangover, been in, being in academia with a master's degree and then a PhD for the last 13 years and being in an environment where everything, every thought had to be expressed in sort of this pristine, right. clear, stylistically accurate form. Right. And that self kind of questioning and the self-doubt that goes with that. But what I'm but back to Gord's point, I think what, what social media and the intimacy of the format are doing is that it's pushing us up against our own internal barriers, our own issues. Right. Of, that otherwise we may we we otherwise would have never come into contact with in such mm. an immediate way. So um, I both, which is both exciting and anxiety producing, isn't it? it it's is. kind of like whoa! I didn't realize that I would be so you know I didn't realize I would care so much about that or this or it's so interesting what you say that it 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 almost puts a mirror up to your own kind of idiosyncratic you know, little minor, you know, hesitancies or apprehensions or anxieties. I love that. David, please, Gord says, David, please, what is the magic bullet to courage yourself? I'm trying to get, I'm trying to get Gord, David. This is a little inside job here. I'm trying to get Gord to go live and he's so reticent. He's a YouTube creator. He's got a beautiful channel, a how-to channel where he creates fabulous videos on editing software, on being, growing your channel, on producing quality videos. 
And uh, oh, I need to watch his seriously, Peter. No, I'm serious. You need to go. He's the master. His channel is amazing. You and Gord need to connect. He's a very yeah, intelligent guy. Or Gord or Peter or somebody, please. I will. I will post yeah. his. Uh, yeah, I will I actually that. in the comments. I'll post his channel. Everybody should subscribe to it. But uh, so I've been trying to get him to go live, and he wants to go live because he's such a great interviewer, as you can see, right? For me, there are confidence issues. He says. Yeah. What do you What do you have to say to that? I mean, everybody has confidence issues, right? Be I mean, there's some I mean, that are, I mean, like Gary V or people like that, perhaps they, yeah. they have this un, unparalleled sort of, I don't give an F kind of thing, even though I think he really cares more than he lets on. Uh, right. But, but I think, I, you know, even, I think everybody, I don't know. What are your thoughts, David? Well, my thoughts are because. <laughs> great question. It is a great question. And one of the things I can relate to it tremendously because I'm, I, st I still do, I do a little bit of live stuff, but I'm not, I mean, like Peter, I'm, I'm just so impressed with you and how natural you are in this format and how comfortable you are. And, and I said to you before we went live tonight is that I watched several episodes and, and I can tell you, and I have to, in, in all honesty, this is not like smoozing because you no, of course not. On, this, on this show, but watching you and watching how comfortable you were what it allowed me to do is rethink my approach on um, on social media and streaming in that, like when I talked about my story in social services and how right. I, that's actually the first time that I've done that. Really? Kind of interview that told that story. Oh, cool. Because we got a David Holzmer exclusive folks. <laughs> there we go. Yes. Because, because I think about, um, that I just, it, it's important to be real. It's important, yes. you know, and for so long I tried to package my approach to organizations and thinking from a purely theoretical standpoint. And I would, and, and what I would find is that people's eyes would glaze over. And I thought about it and watching your, you know, episodes, what I thought was, why not just tell my story? Yes. And, and I, I, and I sketched a few notes and so forth, but I guess when I go back to Gord, it's, I think at a certain level, what we have to be willing to do is we have to make a decision. Are, are we going to fight the good fight? And what I mean by that is, are we going to enter into the arena to confront our own limitations and, Beautiful. and, to, and to fall down sometimes and to get our knees scraped and to look dumb and to, and 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 to be willing to make those errors because and again this gets back to it because if we have a, a stable core of relationships that we can fall back on that safety we, net that safety that atmosphere safety net, right we know it's going to be okay okay i love it here's the, here's what i want to add to that if i may david Something I've been telling you, Gord, I know you're watching. And by the way, Michael, thank you. Michael actually posted Gord's channel on, in the comments. So when you go back and I'll look at the stream, out. yeah, when you go back and look at the stream, David, you'll see it in the comments, Gord's right. channel, and you will learn a shit ton. He is amazing. Um, I've been telling Gord all the time, the expectation, and I'm actually creating, you know, I don't know how, if I've ever even said this on, on air before, but I'm actually creating a sort of live streaming for beginners course uh that i because you know just something that i hope will be helpful and i hope having the credibility of actually being a university professor will hopefully give me that ethos but um i've been saying it you know and and here's more confirmation from david the expectations of your audience when you go live they're not expecting polished pre-scripted everything to be perfect all the cuts all the lighting all the angles all the equipment every word having to be perfectly orchestrated that's just not the expectation here you're hearing it from doctor not forget about professor nez you're hearing it from dr holzmer gourd even the doctor the good doctor is saying would just you, be would real you just be real for that gourd say again <laughs> would you, would you yes like me to write you a prescription for that that's <laughs> Give him an RX, will you, Doc? Yeah. <laughs> hey, Doc, help him out, will you? <laughs> so, so I mean, it's it's brilliant. I mean, 
Um, I think I totally get it. And, and I think this would be a nice little segue. We've already reached the uh, hour point. It feels like it's been five minutes, David. Oh, my word. I've been having so much fun talking with you. We got to do this again. I mean, this is awesome. Absolutely. But, you know, it's interesting what, to kind of maybe do some sort of a review or wrap up here, a nice segue. Isn't it funny how what Dr. Holzmer was saying earlier about relationships, the core of the core of building and sustaining these teams and organizations and even leadership, right? Has to do with that relationship, that trust. I think that, I think that what's, what's beautiful about Facebook groups, which we haven't even talked about yet, which I love, what's beautiful about social media is you can create this community. And when you have this community of support, when you have this community that you can go back and forth with and the level or gradation of safety where you falling down is not judged. You're not chastised, right, for any transgressions, uh, you know, so to speak. You, which, I mean, there's no such thing as perfection. You're going to make mistakes. Mistakes are actually beautiful teachers. Then it's just like everybody else. It's an even playing field, Gord. You're just like everybody else. Live streaming in this format has only been around, and I'd love for the doc to talk about this as well. It's only literally been around in this kind of hyper ease for like the past maybe 18 months, really. I mean, Facebook Live, Periscope, uh, uh, Twitter Live, YouTube Live. I mean, this is really something brand new. And I think what David said earlier too, we have any, we're not even on the brink. We're barely right. on the brink. So you actually have nothing to worry about, I think. Or Gord says, I'm 57 and reinventing and I'm all in. I hope to show boomers how to overcome their resistance to grow at any age. What a beautiful message, Gord. Tina says, Gord, it is vulnerability and authenticity. It draws an audience online. Just be you. Everybody else is taken. Beautiful. Wow. Michael says, Rx, one shot of confidence combined with who cares, just have fun and do it. <laughs> now, if ever there was a prescription, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Holzberg. <laughs> there you go. Doctor, I want to give you an opportunity because I, mean, I, I have just had a blast. I hope you've had fun too. I feel like I've learned. Right. I feel like I've learned so much. I love the connections that you made in your analysis. And it almost feels to me like an abstract. You just did this whole episode of Nez Nation Live has sort of been like an abstract of your thesis and your dissertation. And I love it. I just love it. I want to give you an opportunity, David. What do you want our Nez Nation audience to leave with before we say goodbye and wrap up? What is one thing that you feel in all of your experiences and all of your studies is there one takeaway that us laymen, <laughs> that us laymen can maybe extrapolate <laughs> yeah. and, and, and absorb and maybe even apply? Is there anything like, hey, this is what I'd like to share with you at the end. And this is what I'd like to share with you. This is the big takeaway. What would you say to that? And what, if there is anything, no sure. pressure. <laughs> I kind of made that sound a lot of bigger than it needed to be <laughs> because it's, I don't feel pressure because really my research brought this forward to Beautiful. me because I talked about how, what I found is that managers to be effective had to exercise a lot of psychological safety, but that was just one of the components. And the other component was and this this goes to our conversation tonight and the things that Gord and Tina are talking about is that there was another there were several actually but I'll just give you one more and so first was psychological safety and the second was continual affirmation of interdependence now that sounds like a mouthful but let me tell you what Love it means it continual affirmation or conversation based on the notion that I need you to, to do whatever, to do this project. We need each other. You know, I'm talking in a management sense, but I think in a broader sense, we need one another. It's the notion of expertise is dead. I mean, here's the thing. I can talk to you about my research, but it only has meaning in the conversation of what you're dealing with. And, and when you talk to me or when I hear these comments about what other people are dealing with, that informs what I'm thinking as well. So this is, we need each other. We absolutely yes. do. And yes. I don't think we should forget that. Oh my goodness. That is just, that's awesome. 
Absolutely terrific stuff. I mean, what a great show, Nez Nation. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Nez Nation Live, and this will be posted on the page. Um, I want to just extend an amazing thank you to Dr. David Holzmer for his time and for being on our show. It's been an honor, my friend. I really do mean it. We need to do this again. Yes. Uh, I would love to have you on the show. I would love to have, we've got some great comments here. Michael says, that was great. Thanks for your time and your share of knowledge. Tina says, you have no idea how happy it makes me to geek out about communication and relationships. She said she was a mass comm major, an organizational comm minor, got a GED, went to college at 41, graduated in 2015. Awesome, Tina. Gord says, great insight, David. Much appreciated. Great interview, guys. You know, I read a quote earlier today, David. I'd love you to kind of think about this. And actually, I think it was sent, sent by Gord. Looking forward to seeing you both soon. Thank you, Michael. The greatest service, the greatest value you can bring is how you affect others. How, how you affect others is the greatest value you can bring to this world. And David, I think what you're doing, and, and I, one of the main reasons I, I really love your stuff and wanted to, I was so hoping you would say yes to be on the show, was that I love what you're doing because you're having an effect on people. You're having an effect on all of us. And I want to say to you, much continued success, my friend. And you have a friend in me, Professor Nez. Oh, I sound like the Toy Story movie. <laughs> But you do. <laughs> this is what happens, Nez Nation. This is what happens when you have two kids under six. You start, you start talking in Disney parables, basically. <laughs> but uh, I, I mean, seriously, David, uh, I, I hope you continue doing what you're doing. And I hope that this encourages you to keep doing what you're doing. Because you, sir, you definitely have a positive effect and impact on people. And you're servicing oh. others. And I cherish it. And I want you to continue doing so. So much, much success to you. God bless you and your family. Uh, I wish you all the best. And I'm going to leave, by the way, before you leave, David, I am going to have David's information in the description, where you can find David, how you can reach him, how you too can learn from him, how you can follow him and listen to him and learn. You have to listen to this guy. He is teaching. He is dropping knowledge every day, ladies and gentlemen. So I will be leaving that in the notes. So you haven't heard the last of David, that's for sure. Uh, you're going to get a lot more from him. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit subscribe and you'll always be notified of when we post the latest interviews and latest videos, how-tos, and we would really, really appreciate that. On behalf of Dr. David Holzmer, Nez Nation, this is your host, Professor Nez. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Tina says, yeah, are you kidding? We've already Facebook stalked him and found all that. <laughs> Oh yes, you got to go everywhere. You got to go everywhere. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you again to Dr. Holzmer. We wish you a fantastic evening. Thank you very much. And this is your host, Professor Nez. We'll see you guys next time. We are signing off and thank you. And we are out. Thank you, y'all. All right, David. All right, David. That was... That was <laughs> phenomenal.